behind because she showed some of the figures that I'm going to use here, so I, I guess on some parts I will be able to go faster. But I think it's important to insist in the fact that uh, we cannot lose the perspective. And, and concrete, when we talk about concrete, we are talking about the second most used substance after water. We use a lot of this stuff. And this is basically why the problem cement that we need to make this concrete is accountable for about 7% of the industrial energy use and roughly 8% of the anthropogenic CO2. Uh, during the presentation, I will make a lot this distinction, so I, I know that you are all aware of this, but you will see why this will make sense down the line. Portland cement is this combination of clinker and gypsum, and concrete is a much more complicated mixture of stuff, where actually cement is the minority of the volume, and about 70% of the stuff is uh, the skeleton of aggregates with different weightings in order to fill the space. But if we look at the CO2, it is very clear that uh, most of it is coming from this clinker fraction. So even though we have a minority of the volume of the concrete made out of cement, most of the CO2 is coming from there. And it makes a lot of sense then that during the last 10, 15 years, our research efforts have been focused to reduce the clinker factor in cement because this is where the CO2 is coming from. We cannot miss perspective, and I'm very glad that Karen introduced this plot before, though that concrete is a very efficient material from an energetic and from a CO2 point of view, particularly compared with the spectra of other construction materials that we have available. So concrete is a low carbon material today, and it will remain dominant. And I, I think that I don't need to insist this further after the arguments given in the previous presentation. From a scientific point of view, for myself and for my students then, we are looking at a problem of optimizing a material that is already the optimum that we have, and this makes it, in my opinion, particularly challenging. So, given though concrete and cement-based materials will remain dominant, clinker replacements, what we call use SCMs to reduce the clinker factor, is recognized today as the most efficient way to reduce the embodied CO2 of cement. But the problem is, is that in the last 10 uh, years, 10, 15 years, and Karen already introduced this plot, uh, we haven't made real progress on increasing our replacement level. And there is only three materials, limestone, fly ash, and slag, that we are using in quantity. And the reasons for this, you can think that they are diverse, but are mainly related with uh, availability, as we will see in the next slide. The problem is that we are stuck in this range of 20 to 25% replacement, and on the other hand of the table, we have roadmaps for CO2 savings, like the one that GCCA is proposing, which is aiming to get an average clinker factor by 2050 of 0.52. So the question is how we are going to materialize that average clinker factor of 0 0.52 when a situation where we got stuck already at 25% replacement. So we have halfway to go. So the first argument for going then for limestone and calcium clays is definitely an availability one. So we, we haven't been able to increase our replacement level of clinker by supplementary cementitious material because we don't have enough stuff. If you compare the demand of cement today with the availability of other materials, you can see that there is no way to replace, let's say, 50%. And it's only calcium clay and limestone, these two materials that can really change the situations because they're available in quantity and they're available, more importantly, in the places where we need uh, cement and concrete production, which is in the emerging economies. A second argument that I would like to add to the availability one is a reactivity argument. Calcium clays are by far more reactive than the other SCMs that we have around, and I hope to convince you during my presentation that reactivity is not just a metric, it's also one of the keys that we have to save CO2 when we talk about low carbon cement and more importantly, low carbon concrete. So, very importantly in this pathway to low carbon concrete is LC3. And what we have achieved with LC3 is remarkable. So this is a project that has been led for the last 10 years by EPFL in Lausanne in Switzerland. And it's basically a blended cement, so we are still talking about Portland cement-based materials, which combines clinker, calcium clay, limestone on a 50% replacement ratio. Basically allowing us to say between 30 and 40% CO2. And most importantly, achieving equivalent performance to Portland cement and enhanced durability as current detail. Uh, a 
I'm very happy that in this presentation I can already confirm to you this was not the case a few years ago that this cement is already included in the European standard EN197 under the denomination CEN2C. So, while this is like the typical uh, combination or recipe to make LC3 that we, we tend to show people, uh, it's important to realize that LC3 is really a family of blended cements, and these proportions of limestone, calcite, clay, and clinker can be adjusted in order to get the properties that we need for a particular application. So we are basically here in what we call LC350, 50, 50 standing for this 50% clinker factor, but I see significant opportunities for going even further in the reduction of clinker content, and this uh, avenue is basically enabled by the high reactivity of cars and clays. And I would like to show some results and some thoughts in this direction during the presentation. So the question, the first question that I would like to, to, to share with you and, and invite uh, to the discussion is that is really the 50% clinker factor the final frontier for LC3, or we can think that in some markets and in some applications we can develop materials with even lower amounts of clinker. And does it actually make sense to do that? So certainly, when we look at the CO2 saving potential of LC3, again, quoting this number that we have repeatedly insisted during the presentations, between 30 and 40 percent savings, and we get, as you see there on the left, a comparable strength compared to PC. And certainly, as we start decreasing further the amount of clinker, well, we don't get the same strength at PC anymore. The strength will start going down, and also the CO2 start also going down as well. So this is probably something that you were expecting. So what are the CO2 saving potential from doing that? Well, if we go to something like 35% clinker, we can say between, let's say, 47 and 54% CO2. If we go to something like 25% clinker, we can say between 60 and 64% CO2. Refer to someone, refer to OPC, and assuming that we are replacing the clinker with a combination of calcium clay and limestone. But the strength is also going down. So then the, the question, does it really make sense to do this, is not obvious. And um, also, we have an answer where the challenges are the technical barriers to actually do that. Like, can we actually do it in a way that is reliable and it makes any sense? So in terms of strength, I'm comparing here, I'm showing you results of LC350. And on the right side, you have LC335. So we're already pushed quite below the 50% uh, clinker barrier. And you can see that the strength is actually not so bad, but it's certainly not the same strength level that we get with OPC. And we need to understand why this is happening. And on, on one hand, when we have blended cements, we have clinker hydration, which is kinetically faster than the reaction of SCMs. And uh, we have the reaction of the mineral additions, in this case the calcium clay and the limestone, because remember that there is a synergetic reaction between them that is kinetically slower comparatively to the clinker. And what's happening is that as we decrease the amount of clinker and we increase the amount of SCMs, we are putting much more of the slow stuff and we are reducing the fast stuff. So then my development of strength is also getting retarded compared to PC. And this is key to keep in mind because in some way, reducing the clinker further is an opposed concept or, or, or is driving me in a direction that is um, uh, opposing the early age strength development. And this is something that we need to look at from a scientific point of view in order to find a solution if we want to go in that direction due to the uh, well, interesting CO2 savings that we can get. So, does it make sense to do this? And I will introduce the, the slide that Karen already showed with a little bit more of detail. So I'm originally from Chile. This is a country that is famous for its low clinker factor. It has today an average clinker factor of 67% in the, in the back cement. And this is not because the industry is particularly uh, sustainably driven. It's basically because there is no limestone in the country. And producing clinker has always been very expensive. So, from a, from a cost perspective, they have always been forced to introduce a large amount of SCMs in the cements that we use. And one of the, certainly the standards of the country are made around this, these pozzolanic cements that are available. And one of the strengths that we have, well, these are the two red uh, bars that you see here in the plant. There is a high strength 
gray, which has 80% of clinker factor, and there is a general use, which is this pink little one here, which has 65% clinker factor, and then we are replacing that with calcium clay. And we wanted to compare these with LC335 and LC325, so 35% clinker and 25% clinker. The lines that you see here, these horizontal lines, are the requirements of the standard for both grades of cement and 7 and 20A base. And we can see that we can meet the requirement of high strength with LC335 and for general use with LC325. So basically, with low clinker LC3s, we can meet exactly the same re strength requirements that are in the standard, but saving about 40 to 45% more clinker than if we do it with natural porcelains. And the difference between doing it with natural porcelains or with a combination of calcium clay and limestone is reactivity. So this is why reactivity matters. It's not the same using inert materials or poorly reactive materials than using very reactive combinations like uh, limestone and calcium clays because this is what opens the gate to further reductions of clinical content retaining performance. Why it is working so well then? Why, why this such difference that even with 40% less clinical content, we are getting the same uh, performance than a porcelanic cement that has much more clinker in it? Um, the magic is really the synergetic reaction between metacarolin and limestone that leads to precipitation of carbon luminates, as Karen introduced in her presentation. And we can see here on the plot that when we are comparing LC3, 35, 25, and LC315, actually, we went quite crazy with the reduction in clinker content to an LC350, which is the classical one, that as we reduce the amount of clinker, you can see that the amount of carbon luminate is becoming limited and dropping off plateauing earlier and earlier. And this is because we are running out of Poland light. We are taking more clinker out of the system. We are running out of Poland that earlier, and we cannot sustain the reaction of metacarbon longer. So then, the, an idea could be what happens if we have a small amount of pollen that in order to boost back the reaction of metacarbon in this low clinker system. And this is basically the blue line that you see here, where you see that we can completely increase the amount of reaction that we have, which is also reflected in the de evolution of the degree of reaction of metacarbon in these systems. So basically, the addition of polandite in LC350 doesn't make any difference because this system is not limited by polandite availability. There is plenty of polandite to make it react. But in LC325 and LC315, we are limited by this and by pushing using this admixture. Uh, and this will be a key word during the rest of the presentation. By using this accelerator admixture to boost the reaction, we can actually recover a lot of this reactivity of metacabalium. In terms of microstructure, this basically means that we have all of this amyl monocarbaluminate, which we know now precipitates occupying large pores left behind by clinker hydration, reducing porosity very effectively, very quickly. You see, this is a reaction that has its peak between two and three days of hydration, and definitely contributing to this gap difference between a system with 25% clinker and a system with 65% uh, clinker, depending on the SCM that we are using. On the second part of my presentation, I would like to uh, invite you to follow me in uh, the concept leading to the, the project that I'm leading now at ETH, which is called Ultra Green Concrete, which main idea, if I have to summarize the, the concept of the project in one sentence, is to move the focus, which is now in cement, back to the construction material that is concrete. And I would like to start uh, this uh, section by this very kind of uh, challenging title there. Uh, but I hope that you follow the, the idea that I'm not trying to uh, point the finger at anything, but actually put everything into the uh, measure. So concrete is a building material and cement is not. We don't build infrastructure of houses out of cement. And at the end of the day, what really matters if we are concerned about CO2 footprint is the amount of CO2 per unit volume of construction materials that we're putting in the field. And this certainly depends on the clinker factor. As we saw in the beginning, 96% of the CO2 is coming from that stuff that we call clinker. 
but also when we start thinking about concrete, things like the binder content, how much cement per cubic meter I'm using becomes particularly critical, and how much admixtures I'm using in order to control the properties of that concrete also become critical. So to me, the golden rule is that we need to develop cements, blended of course, with the least amount of embedding CO2, but that have sufficient performance to enable their use without significant increase of the van der Konde per cubic meter. And this, I think, is what distinguishes LC3 with other blended cements, that it allows me to transit the CO2 saving from the bag of cement to the cubic meter of concrete very efficiently. And this is what, in, in this ultra green concrete project, we, we summarize in this concept as the true-false strategy, where we look at the CO2 of cement, which of course is related to the clinker factor, but more importantly, we look at the CO2 of concrete, which is uh, related to a reduction of the paste volume per cubic meter. And what is the potential of doing this? Why we are interested of shifting the focus out of cement and put the spotlight by back to the construction material. Um, I invite you to follow the uh, equivalent CO2 footprint that is shown there on the right, that is normalized to a typical concrete of the Swiss market, 350 kilograms per cubic meter, sent to A. So this is the benchmark that we're using, and we normalize that one to 100 to make it easier to compare. So that concrete will have a composition more or less like the pie chart that you see here, and with things that, like LC3, we already go a long way because we can replace half of that cement with a combination of calcium clay and limestone, and we can reduce our CO2 put footprint by about 30 to 40 percent, which is what we see here. I already show you that in some markets and in some applications, it actually make a lot of sense to think that we can go lower and we can reduce the clinker content even further. But we cannot go to zero. There is a high price to pay in terms of efficiency of performance as low as we go in the clinker content. So there is definitely a reduction on uh, amount of CO2 and clinker that is plateauing up to a certain point. So we cannot go infinitely down in the clinker concrete avenue. But if we move in the other direction and we now look at reducing the amount of binder in the system, the amount of cement paste per cubic meter, is when we can really move and transition from a typical concrete with 100 units of CO2, if you want, to something that has virtually a quarter of the CO2 than the original mix. <laughs> and this is why uh, I think that the road from traditional concrete to the green concrete of the future that we need is paved with clay and limestone because there is basically no other stuff available in that quantity, but also with high performance admixtures. And this is key, as I will illustrate in the next slide. And this is basically what I, uh, I summarize as the workability challenge of low carbon concrete and, and ultra green concrete in particular. Uh, we are trying to reduce the clinker content. That basically means putting more SCMs. SCMs, if we want them to be reactive, they have to be high surface area. And this will have a negative effect in our workability. It's, it's inevitable, it is what it is, and we need to deal with that. At the same time, I'm proposing that we should be reducing the binder amount, the amount of paste, and this basically means reducing the amount of lubrication between aggregates in the concrete mixture. And this also will have a negative effect in my slump and my workability. So there is a clear workability challenge here that we need to have addressed with a, a mixture technology. And particularly the two properties that I'm interested to keep in my material are flow and flow retention. And believe me, that flow retention is probably the most challenging one because uh, it's where exotropy and build-up of system containing calcium clay start to play a major role. And this is a phenomenon that definitely we do not understand completely yet. Uh, but this is what we have at mixtures. This is PCE coming to the rescue. So PCE are these polymers that are in most advanced modern uh, plasticizers and super plasticizers. They have a background that controls the absorption in the surface and they have sign chains that basically provide the steric hindrance and therefore the repulsion between particles. Uh, in this blended cement, the situation is though a little bit more complicated. So we have this lowly PC molecule entering the world and interacted with this LC3 or low carbon cement and basically 
uh, we need to answer now a question of where this admixture is absorbed. We have much more surfaces than just the clinker, as in the case of OPC. Moreover, this process is dynamic, so there is a kinetic component that we need to uh, consider in our equation. Uh, on top of that, there is a lot of admixtures, particularly from the family of PCs, that are known to hinder the hydration of elite or, or C3S. So there is a, a counterplay as well as we were talking in the reducing the clinker factor between keeping rheology, keeping flowability, open time and, op, uh, and, and initial flow versus hydration kinetics. And we need both. And there is certainly an optimum between the two. And what we need to uh, achieve is basically develop new generation of mixtures for this cement that enable us to get flowability without sacrificing uh, early edge performance. Uh, it's important when we are talking about CO2 to re review or to have a look at how CO2 and how environmental impact of this material is quantified. So a very classic uh, way of doing this is to compute or to show the kilograms of CO2 per kilograms of cement that we are using. And there are numbers here that are very well known to you, for example, Kinker 0.85, classic reference number, super plasticizer 1.88. But the problem of this indicator is that it's looking at the bag of cement, and as we said before, this is not a construction material. And what happens between the bag of cement and the track of concrete is uncertain. And it's not always the case that the CO2 saving at this scale is effectively transferred to the concrete scale, because there is performance involved and there is mixture design involved. A more useful scale then would be to look at the kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter of material, looking at the concrete scale. And what we see here, which is also something that Karen already somehow introduced in her presentation, is that there is a lot of scatter. So for example, if we look at the Swiss average in 2019, it was about 216 kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter. But if we look at a publication looking at the situation in the USA, in the Great Lakes area, this value is around 280 to 340. So we, around the world, we are producing concrete with a very varied amount of embodied CO2. And this is certainly a huge opportunity for optimization. A third uh, scale, is, and, and the idea probably would be to talk about CO2 per square meter of building. Uh, there is already some regulations like the RE 2020 in France that are looking at setting limits to the amount of CO2 uh, per square meter of new building. Uh, the interesting things of this scale of quantifications is that each of them is talking to a different stakeholder of the value chain. The first one is clearly speaking to the cement producer, the second one to the concrete producer or the engineer, and the third one likely to the architect or the designer. Uh, it is very easy for me to expect that since the designer will be able to estimate what is the limit CO2 per square meter, he will be able to transfer that requirement to the concrete producer, and therefore the concrete producer will set a limit to the maximum CO2 per cubic meter that he can produce. So in my opinion, these are basically the two metrics that are more useful to move forward. And we need to start looking away of quantifying this at the scale of cement because uh, it neglects how the material is actually being used. And if we look then uh, at the kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter and the decarbonization potential of the two-fold strategy, this idea of reducing clinker and reducing binder, what I'm doing here is looking at a data set that was published uh, recently of different concrete mixtures in different studies all over the world. So there is, you see a distribution of the amount of CO2 that these mixtures have. And basically, um, and this is obviously a proposal, and the numbers and the, the limits are open to discussion, and the more data we get, the better the proposal that we can do in this sense. Uh, we can establish kind of regions. What, where are we trying to go with something that we could say low carbon concrete, or with something that we could call ultra green concrete? And what could be like the clinical factors and the band of quantities that would enable myself to get into those ranges. So we can see, for example, that if we take the average value, which at the moment in this data set is 250, and then we take the best 15%, we can set one limit for low carbon concrete, let's say 160 kilograms per cubic meter. 
And uh, this is basically a wrench that we can easily access with LC3. So if we all use LC350, we can basically produce already low carbon concrete out of the box with any almost binder content that you want. This is assuming a worst case scenario for clicker, so you improve your thinking as well, that opens the game. But the Ultramarine Concrete project is a little bit more ambitious, and we propose to go and, and to develop technologies to enable making concrete with less than 100 kilograms of CO2 per cubic meter. Uh, the problem with the previous approach is that it neglects performance, it doesn't look at strength, so probably it makes more sense to look at the data on a way similar as the group of uh, Professor Bamberley did in the Ultramarine Concrete uh, Ecoefficient Cement Report for, for UNEP, where we normalize this CO2 intensity by megapascal, and we can establish the same kind of limit. So the, the green area would be uh, low carbon concrete, uh, limited by these values here, and ultramarine concrete would be lower than 100, and then it stays stable at a certain value of CO2 cubic meter megapascal to not penalize high performance materials. Uh, it looks very challenging because as you see there are not so many points in the ultramarine concrete area. This is basically uh, because how the codes are made now in, in Europe. But based on the trials that we have been able to make so far in the lab, you can see that it is very much possible to get within the uh, low carbon concrete uh, section of the plot. And in some cases, we have been able to incur in the ultramarine concrete without still optimizing that mixture. So there is a lot of potential and a lot of uh, hope that we will be able to achieve this uh, during the duration of this project. And these are some of the, of the mixtures that we have been working to. So the first two, based on this arbitrary definition that I proposed, would be low carbon concrete. The last one would be an ultramarine concrete. You see the strength there, the binder contrast, and these were all made with LC350. So we are not even going yet into the direction of reducing the clinker factor even lower. The problem with all of these technologies is that the EL standard for concrete has a prescriptive approach to meet the reliability requirements, which is basically a deem to satisfy idea. There is a certain water to cement ratio, there is a certain minimum binder content that someone, based on experience, established that is required to meet a certain criteria of durability performance. And the problem is that these kind of prescriptive tables do not enable us and allow us to move into low carbon concrete uh, materials. So I think that since changing standards is something that takes time, definitely we need to do it. At least we should allow it at the minute alternative verification through performance testing. So allow people to do low carbon concrete and validate their exposure and durability performance through testing. And the interesting part of that is that probably the outcome of this testing can feedback the standard and we can enter into a more extended discussion of how we change the standard into a performance-based uh, qualification for durability requirements of concrete. So with this, I would like to conclude my presentation with the main ideas that I have presented. So the first, we can only move forward with cement-based materials on a worldwide scale. There is just nothing else available in the scale to make a significant replacement of cement-based materials, particularly concrete. Using cuts and clays and limestone enable enormous cuts in clinker, not only because they are available, but also because they are reactive. And that reactivity is really what uh, opens this whole new avenue of exploring systems with 20% clinker, 30% clinker, particularly in cases where PC level strength is not required. Chemical admixtures, in my opinion, are the enablers, enablers of sustainable concrete. Without chemical admixtures, we are not going to go anywhere because we have a workability issue at hand that we need to solve and tackle if we want to achieve things like low carbon concrete and altering concrete. And uh, we need ambitious, like these two limits that I put uh, I, I offer as a proposal here in my presentation, but still attainable, like the LCC range, goes towards the carbonization of cement and concrete industry. Um, I think that we need performance-based metrics uh, to move forward because this is the only way that we are going to move from comparing bags of cement to comparing materials 
in uh, field applications are therefore apples with apples and not things that are completely different. I would like to thank everyone for your attention and I'm more than happy to take questions during the coffee breaks or during the, the conference.